Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back. Today we're going to go through the 13 nonfiction books that I've purchased over the last few months. These are books that I'm very, very excited about. I don't know how many of them I'll actually get to very quickly because I just started grad school, so I'm going to be doing a lot of reading, but I don't know if I'm going to necessarily be doing a lot of reading for myself, but we'll see. If you guys have read any of these, do give me your spoiler-free thoughts down in the comments below. I would be very interested to know what you guys think. Also let me know if there's a particular book in here or books in here that you think I should start with. I would be very interested to know that as well because I want to get to kind of like the most interesting ones right away. So yeah, let's get into it. So the first one is actually a book that I wasn't going to mention in this video because it's legitimately just one of the textbooks for one of my classes this year. I feel like at this point if I don't mention it for anybody out there who is using the statistical software R or R Studio and you're just getting started with it, I feel like I would be doing you a disservice. So I am talking about getting started with R. This is an introduction for biologists. This one's the second edition and it is by Andrew P. Beckerman, Dylan Z. Childs, and Owen L. Petchley. Owen L. Petchy. Petchy? Petche. So far it's making diving into R a much easier task for me, so I figured that I would mention it to give a little public service announcement for anyone out there that is having to learn the statistical software R, which is notoriously difficult to get into. I know, it sucks, but we're all gonna get through it, it's okay. So getting into some of the books, the first one I wanted to talk about is actually a book that I already had a copy of and that I eventually hope to have three total copies of, and that is On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. So I had this one, this is like a pocket book, little like cheap paperback version of it that I got when I was in my undergrad, and then I recently picked up this kind of nicer version, and it's got kind of thicker paper in it. And the reason why I wanted to pick this one up, even though I already had a copy of On the Origin of Species, is because I wanted a copy that I would feel okay annotating. So I feel like I can take like highlighters or pens or something to this one and the paper will hold up, whereas the paperback version I don't think it would have. I did mention that I wanted to have a third copy of this in my life at some point, and I really just want to have like a really old version of On the Origin of Species, so if you guys have any ideas of places online that I can look for that other than like eBay, do let me know because I'd be very interested in having an early copy of On the Origin of Species. Next up I've got a recent release which is actually very very popular that I'm surprised I haven't actually got to reading it yet, although I kind of did take like a three month break from reading in general, so maybe I'm not that surprised. And that is of course Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. This book seems to be pretty much exactly what it sounds like, where the author Malcolm Gladwell will be talking about a lot of examples and case studies of humans interacting with humans that they don't already know, i.e. strangers. So I'm very very interested in this. I have read his book Outliers and I really really liked how he did research and seemed to be quite conscientious in terms of citing that research in that book, so I'm very interested to get into his latest work and see if it's everything that I hope it's going to be. So the next one that I've got is a book by Jay Ingram, and that is Talk Talk Talk. Now for me, this was one of those books that I was at the bookstore and I saw the name Jay Ingram and I was like, I know that name, but I don't know who that is. And I actually was looking it up for this video and Jay Ingram was the host of Daily Planet on Discovery Channel. And I'm like, of course, that's where I know him from. Um, I used to watch a lot of Discovery Channel growing up, so that makes a lot of sense as to why his name is like engraved in my brain, but I didn't actually know that it was him. Anyways, the point is, there are some topics out there that I find endlessly interesting. Evolution is one of them, language happens to be another one, so I think this will be a really good place for me to start in looking at kind of a well-rounded look at the different aspects that go into language, everything from the actual physical structures that create sounds to how society and cultures have used language and continue to use language now and into the future. So I'm definitely going to look into more books by Jay Ingram if I like this because I feel like now I'm only going to be able to read this book in his voice from Daily Planet. So. That should be fun. Next up we've got a book that is very very popular that I'm kind of surprised I haven't already gotten into reading, and that is of course The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and that's by Rebecca Skloot. If you're unfamiliar there is this certain cell line, that is to say a group of cells that have been proliferated in a lab setting, that is very very widely used by scientists and has been since I believe the 1950s, and that cell line is called the HeLa cell line getting its name, of course, from Henrietta Lacks. 
there has been a lot of talk about HeLa cells and kind of how they were unethically taken from this individual without her knowledge and then used for years and years to come in scientific research. And I basically decided to pick this book up because I wanted to learn more about that situation and I've heard that this can be a really, really good starting place for that. So hopefully I can educate myself on the history of HeLa cells and their widespread use and how this actually ended up happening. Moving on to our next book, we've got the last book that Stephen Hawking wrote, or at least I believe it's the last book he wrote before his death in 2018, and that is Brief Answers to the Big Questions. This is a book that I've been looking at since it came out in 2018, shortly after Stephen Hawking's death, and it's something that I just feel myself drawn to. Maybe it is because it was the last book that he put out before passing away, I don't know, but I feel very drawn to it. The thing that I kind of love about nonfiction books is that often their titles tell you everything that you need to know about kind of just what the book is about. Whereas with fiction, you often will get things that you're like, I have no clue what this book is about. At least in this case, we know that this book is about brief answers to the big questions. If I go on the Penguin Random House website, I've actually found that some of the questions discussed in this book include stuff like, does God exist? And will humanity survive? And those are some pretty big questions that I am quite interested in reading a little bit about. I also really like Stephen Hawking's writing style and his witty humor, so I think this one will be a really, really fun, interesting read. I do know that this book is very, very popular, so if you have read it, do let me know your spoiler-free thoughts down in the comments below. Next up, we've got Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin. This is a book that I've heard a lot about. I've heard that title thrown around a lot. I've heard that term, Your Inner Fish, thrown around a lot. And for the longest time, I kind of had no idea what this book was about. I was like, oh, okay, it's another popular science book, whatever. But as I've gotten more and more interested in evolution and evolutionary theory, it's kind of something that's right up my alley. This book apparently goes into talking a lot about homologous traits, so if you don't know what that is, basically it is said in evolutionary theory that we all kind of evolved from fish in the sea, hence your inner fish, and we've got traits that are very, very similar to some of the animals that would be considered our ancestors or that we have evolved from. So that apparently is what this book talks about quite a bit. I'm very, very excited for this. It seems like every time that I read a book like this, I find more and more threads of evolutionary theory to go and read up on. So I think this will be a really, really good and informative read for me. Moving on, I think that most, if not all of my nonfiction hauls have a book by this author, and that is of course Edward O. Wilson, and this is the book, The Future of Life. I don't know what it is about Edward O. Wilson, but when I see a book by him, I buy it. I haven't even read any of his books before, but I own three of them. I'm kind of, I have this like nice modest little collection that I'm working on. And I feel like the reason why I do this is because Edward O. Wilson is one of the names that stuck out to me a lot in my undergrad degree when I was learning about some of these scientists that have come before me. Um, and basically, if you don't know, Edward O. Wilson is seen as the father of sociobiology. Sociobiology is something that I learned a little bit about in undergrad, and it's something that I think is a super cool topic, so I just kind of always go and gravitate towards buying Edward O. Wilson books, even though I haven't read any of them, but I have this lovely collection now, so it's okay. Anyways, in this book, apparently Wilson is looking at kind of what we've done to the earth, what our legacy is on this earth, and perhaps some things that we can do in the future to kind of, oh, I don't know, make up for some of the damage we've caused. It sounds like a really interesting read. It sounds like a very timely read as well these days. So I think it's something that I would like to pick up soon. I have a feeling that one day I'm just going to snap and read all of his books, like one after another. Maybe I'll make a video about it. We'll have like an Edward O. Wilson-a-thon or something. I don't know, that sounds so nerdy, but maybe it'll happen one day. I'm very excited about this book. I'm very excited about all of his books that I own and one day I'll just have to go ahead and read them. Okay, so I have to be completely honest with you guys. There are two reasons why I picked up this next book. The first reason is not really a great one, it's just that I have another book by Cambridge University Press that kind of goes along in this series, and I wanted this one to match that one, so I bought it. The second reason is, of course, that I'm actually interested in what this book is about, and that book is On Growth in Form by Darcy Thompson. Just flipping through this book, it does look super cool. It kind of looks like a biophysics take on how evolution and nature decided 
what things would look like, which is super cool to me. So I am very interested in picking this one up. Also, it looks really nice next to its brother, The Theory of Evolution by John Maynard Smith on my bookshelf. So no regrets. Okay, so next up we're going to take a dip into the world of probably one of the better known science writers, and that is of course Richard Dawkins. Today I'm looking at The Greatest Show on Earth. This is the second book by him that I will have owned. Um, I also have The Ancestor's Tale, which believe me, that is a long book that's going to take me a long time to get through. Regardless, when you hear the name Richard Dawkins, I feel like you either smile or you cringe. It just depends on who you are. I think that he's a very, very polarizing person. He's got a very, very, what would the word be? Poignant writing style, maybe? Um, I personally really like it, and I think that his writing style is something that can really be learned from. In general, this book seems to take on the argument of kind of creationism slash intelligent design theory versus evolutionary theory. This is, of course, very controversial for a lot of people, so I'm not sure that I would recommend this book to everybody. However, that argument or debate is something that I'm very, very interested in learning more about. If perhaps reading a whole book on the subject is not something that you're totally up for, there is a really, really good debate between, at least <laughs> it's really entertaining, between Bill Nye and Ken Ham. So if you go and look that up, I know that you used to be able to look that up on YouTube. I'm assuming it's still there for free. I don't know, this is a few years ago. I used to watch this debate like every Saturday night because I have a life. Um, but it's really entertaining. And if you want to learn more about like the creationism versus evolutionary theory debate, um, then go ahead and check that out maybe if you don't want to read a whole book about it. That was kind of my first introduction to the topic and it sparked an interest and I also found that Richard Dawkins talks a lot about it and hence I have purchased this book. So what would a non-fiction book haul be without a little bit of anthropology? It would, it would still be a non-fiction book haul, but it would be considerably less interesting to me. The next book up is going to be Origins Reconsidered, and that is by Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin. So this was another one of those books that I was in the bookstore and I was like, Richard Leakey, my undergrad brain or whatever's left of it is spinning. It's like, you recognize that name, Nicole. What is? Richard Leakey famous for. And I felt so stupid when I opened this book and I was like, oh, that's what he was famous for. Richard Leakey was one of the individuals along with his team that discovered the famous Turkana boy, which this book actually says, and I quote, is one of the most significant paleoanthropological discoveries of all time. So I don't know how I just forgot about that, but <laughs> I recognized the name, I picked up the book and that is what matters. At least that's what I keep telling myself. Anyways, this book goes on to say, and I think that I'm just going to read it because it puts it perfectly. It basically says that in this book, Leakey incorporates ideas from philosophy, anthropology, molecular biology, and even linguistics to investigate not only how we evolved anatomically, but how we acquired the qualities that make us human. Things like conscientiousness, creativity, and culture. Guys, my nerd heart is so happy. Was this even 13 books? I haven't counted. It's fine. Everything's fine. So to round off this nonfiction book haul, I've got a couple of kind of instructional books. If you don't know, I am somebody who has been very, very interested in knitting for a very long time. I know like half of you guys were like, nah. I'm out. Knitting, boring. But let me tell you, knitting is pretty darn fun. It's really, really creative and really interesting to me personally. Although I will say that pretty soon I am planning on releasing a video about a book inspired knitwear project that I've been working on. It's almost done and I'm really excited about it. So guys, do stay tuned for something like that. Subscribe if you haven't already because I'm really proud of it. I'm really excited and it's almost done. So you'll see that video soon. I seem to be very, very selective on the knitting books that I let into my circle. The first one I'm going to talk about is actually Alice Starmore's Charts for Color Knitting. This is a super, super popular book. Most people probably have this in their collection if they're into knitting. And it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's just a book full of charts for color knitting. And guys, there are a few things in this world that make me more happy than a good color knitting chart something that I can either directly copy and add into my knitting, 
or something that I can kind of modify and make my own. I love books like this. It's kind of an awesome resource. So if you're into color knitting, definitely check out this book. Finally, the last book for today is Knitwear Design Workshop by Shirley Payden, Padden, Payden, I don't know. I stumbled upon this book in a way that seems completely serendipitous. It seems like such good luck because not too long ago, just back in June, I knit my first sweater. I basically started to think after knitting my first sweater, wouldn't it be so cool if I could find a guide, like a book or a blog or even a YouTube channel or something that could teach me basic design elements of knitwear so that I could modify patterns or create my own. That's what this is. From the brief flip through that I've given this book so far, it looks like a huge wealth of information about construction of garments. And guys, that is exactly what I was looking for. So if you're looking for something similar, kind of like a starting point to learning basic garment construction when it comes to knitting, then I, I mean, I haven't used it that much, but so far I would say I highly recommend this book. It seems to have tons and tons of useful information. Anyways, guys, I will spare you my ranting about more knitting stuff. Guys, if you've made it to the end, thank you so much for sitting through all of my non-fiction book haul. I am so excited to get to so many of these books, especially the knitting ones. That's all I've got for you guys today. If you have read some of these books again and you want to give me recommendations as to which ones you think I'd enjoy or which ones I should get to first, do leave that in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to put a like on this video and to subscribe for future stuff just like this. Thank you guys so much for watching to the end, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!